But if I if I try to press the the links, like I can see them, right? But they don't seem to be showing on the screen. So if anybody would like would like copy of the PowerPoint slides, so you can do the links yourself, right? Just let me know. I'm very very happy to to share it. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to be talking um, to this question of opening up a world, right? And my final slide um, is going to uh, explain um, uh, the source of that of that quotation. Um, so it's going to include various quotations from um, neurodivergent um, and autistic people, for example, um, one of whom uh, said the phrase that I've used to, um, to begin this talk. Um, so, um, so in broad terms, I'm going to be talking about how and why classical myth resonates with being autistic. Um, I want to take you through the journey I've been on and on um, uh, and where I want to go next with this work. Um, what I'm going to be focusing on particularly, um, hopefully if I move the mouse, you can see what I'm doing, <laughs> is this figure here, right? It, Hercules, right? Um, but also, right, very much. Um, Okay, on slides, I always want everything to do as much work as, as possible. This is actually taken from the front cover of a forthcoming book I'll say more about in a, in a moment. Um, so um, it's, it's, uh, it's a reimagining re by an artist based in Warsaw of the key image, right, that is the focal point of the book. There's a lot of zooming in, right? Autism can be about huge big pictures, right? But it can also be about being very detail orientated. So there's a lot of zooming, 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 right? Mythology, down to classical mythology, down to Hercules, down to a particular myth of Hercules, down to a particular representation of that myth of Hercules, which is the one um, here. Um, and it's one with huge ramifications for so many things, um, including various autistic experiences that I want to say some things about, uh, including, all right, and here's why I've got this image here, choice making, right? Choice making can be something uh, <laughs> like, like this afternoon when I was trying to get into Bristol, I was so close. I knew I was very close to Woodland Road where the department is, um, but I was choose <laughs> which path to take. Well, led me on some interesting journeys around the center of Bristol. Right, it was a bit scary. <laughs> anyway, there we are. But I made it and it feels good. Um, so choice making, something that um, autistic people, anyway, no, choice making can be hard for, for anybody, but um, it can be something that can cause sort of particular issues um, when you're autistic. Uh, uh, so everything's, everything's doing work. Um, and the representation of, of Hercules is often known as the choice of Hercules, where he has to choose between two very divergent, very different paths in life, represented by two women. Um, behind him, the artist has put um, the Milky Way, the Milky Way that Hercules, there were, there were various uh, um, global myths about how the Milky Way was created. Um, one is that it was Hercules, right? So this is, this is something very Hercules, Hercules that created the Milky Way when he bit Hera's nipple so hard, right? That she recoiled in pain and um, the, the result of the spurting milk was um, the Milky Way. So it's very Herculean also. Now, um, autism is often conceptualized as a spectrum Autistic people are often sometimes to be a bit euphemistic, which is I think, problematic, um, described as being on the spectrum. And some autistic people prefer that, prefer that terminology. Um, but uh, given that uh, there is a move at the moment to reconceptualize what autism is, I think of it not as a not as a spectrum, I'll say more about this in a little while, but as a constellation. Right. So you've got it's a multi-dimensional, it's something multi-dimensional, right? Spectrum is maybe a bit static, it doesn't have to be, but it does have those connotations. Um, so it's multi-dimensional multi-dimensional. Um, and uh and because of um I because I embrace right this concept of autism as as um constellation, um, the fact that we have something astral here, something starry here, um, is I think very appropriate. So, um, oops, I'm going to hopefully, hang on, I just want to move to the next slide. Oh, good, yeah, I just did it. I don't quite sure how I did that, but I did it. Now, um, uh, now I'm not sure if I'm officially meant to um, share this yet, but this is, um, this is the, um, this is a version of the, the front cover of um, a book that uh, is from the series, as you can see here, um, Our Mythical Childhood. Uh, due out very soon, 
uh, it's very much in production at the at the moment. Um, I think it's the most, <laughs> in some ways it's been the, the, the hardest thing I've ever written and it's been the most pleasurable thing I've, I've ever written. I, I, I live this book, I'm still living this book. Um, um, and uh, it's something that's, uh, on one level, on one level, it's been in the pipeline all my life. <laughs> Okay. Um, but particularly when I discovered classical myth when I was about 11, about eight, 10 or 11, right? Um, when I was given a copy of Roger Lanslin's, this is my routine, right? This is how I became a classicist, right? I didn't know what classics was. I wasn't, um, I, I wasn't from a part of the country. I wasn't from a country that, um, where classics um, is very taught. There's a lot of classical receptions around there. I didn't know that at the time. So it's Cardiff, sorry, it's Cardiff. Not that far from where I am right now in, in Bristol. Um, and um, uh, and uh, so I didn't know what were classics meant as opposed to classical music, um, uh, was given Roger Lancelin Green's Tales of the Greek Heroes. And round about the same time, I was given um, Patrick Moore's, the astronomer, right, astronomer, but also um, a classical mythologist, as it turned out, a, a book of him um, where uh, he, uh, that was centered round, right, myths of heroes and uh, et cetera, who were, who were put into the stars, right? I loved, I loved the stars, I loved the planets, I loved, um, um, astronomy and uh, and so so I had that route in but I was really nervous about opening these books I thought what is what are what are tales of Greek heroes what are Greek heroes what is this what does this mean um, and I finally did right when I'd read everything else I've been, I've been given I finally opened it I remember exactly where I was in my grandparents garden on a sunny afternoon because they always were <laughs> right sometime in the late 70s or very early 80s um, my life was never the same again, right? I was in this world that was not mine and yet was mine, okay? Um, and it's and it's from there that um, I felt like bold enough, never, never having studied classics, to do um, a degree in classical studies and theology, then a PhD in classics. Um, and uh, I've been a classicist ever since. So now I'm professor emerita of classics, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, classics is, is, is what I do, but I'm very interested in... Mm, how classics I like to do everything okay and classics for me is so it's so it's so in some respects narrowly traditional in how it's perceived that's not the way I do classics right and I think Esther conveyed that you conveyed that really nicely with the with the introduction about things like you know the toolkit I've, I've written and so on so I'm very interested in the um, experiential applications um, of classics and of classical myth um, so I've like finished this book right minus the you know inevitable you know proof checking and all that kind of thing um and um but it's just the starting point it's not an end point it's the starting point um for me so it's a book of, it's a book of lessons for autistic children um the reason why specifically children um because you know autistic children become autistic adults but the reason why specifically children is the our mythical childhood project um which which has been for um six years right the project finished very recently um, at the end of uh, September. It was going to be five years, but the ERC, who funded it, European Research Council, gave us um, an additional year thanks to COVID delays. Um, and um, uh, so, sorry, I just lost my. Uh, oh, yeah, so I just lost my. Brother. So, yeah, so I finished the book at the uh, under the sort of wing of that uh, of that particular project. So, it, you know, it, it does mark the end of something. And it also marks the end of my time working at Roehampton, because I should also say that not only was I um, the UK sort of lead for this project, um, but the key artifact that I talk I talk about is at the University of Roehampton. So this book is like it's, it's all very much about me, classical mythology. You know? It's all about me, um, and it's about um, and it's about Roehampton um, as well. So it's like it so it marks the end of something, but also very much like the start of the start of something. And if there's time, um, when I start talking about autism, or when I start, start talking about myth, and when the two connect, right? Um, it, you know, sort of an hour is not enough. So, um, but you know, if there's time, I can start talking about where I want to go next. I'm just like, just in case I don't look highlights, um, Medusa, <laughs> Medusa is next. Um, but also, I want to think about other mythologies, including, um, you know, bringing it all back home for me again here, um, Welsh 
mythology. So we shall we shall see, right? So I feel like I'm 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 at the start of something, but I'm at the end of something as well. Okay, so pathways, right? Again, it's all about me here. Um, and um, oops, sorry. Ah, uh, no, I'm sorry, I'm giving things away. I think I'm going the wrong way. No, I'm going the wrong way. Sorry. No, I, no, I was going the right way. I'm sorry, I'm giving away all my ah. Um, no, sorry, I was going the wrong way, and I, I, I want to be on yeah, that one, right. and then I want to share again, don't I? So, it's, sorry about that. Play from current slide, and I've lost me. <laughs> yeah, sorry, did you get me back? <laughs> sorry. I can see everybody now, though, which is lovely, but um, thank you. Yeah, so, uh, sorry. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so moving to the, um, moving to the, uh, the next slide. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to say something really briefly about the, um, our mythical childhood project. Sorry. Oh yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to say something briefly about the um, our mythical childhood project. Um, it's been an amazing thing to be to be part of. It's looking at classical antiquity as it's received in children's and young adults culture. Um, it's global. It's looking at the intersections between the local and the global. Um, and um, one of the things that I've been doing is focusing specifically on the reception of classics in specifically autistic children's culture. Okay, so that sort of helps, amongst other things, answer the question that I um, posed earlier about um, why autistic, why the book is lessons for autistic children specifically. Okay, so I lost my thread, but then I got it back again. I'm going to see if I can actually change. The yes, good. Um, okay, now, um, one of the things I was going to do um, uh, uh, at the very, at the very beginning, and I'll do it now instead um now might be a good time because hopefully everybody who's going to come is now is now here now when i was doing all my teaching during during zoom during zoom during <laughs> during covid <laughs> during zoom during, um uh one of the things that i found worked really well was zoom chat right and i've been missing it but here i am now delivering a session via via zoom so um i have it back again okay so um so I've run uh, as well as well as you know, writing this book and designing the lessons, etc. I have workshops and piloted them over the over the years. OK, including once we went into lockdown um, in sessions that I did online for autistic, well, sometimes for autistic children, sometimes for mixed audiences. Um, and one thing I found worked really well, and this also worked for um, uh, neurodivergent students I was teaching at Roehampton is that they often really liked Zoom chat, right? Okay. Um, and so I thought, well, it seems a missed opportunity because it, not least because I wanted to like, you know, show you something that, that, that worked well um, in the workshopping activities and the piloting activities and dissemination activities. Um, so what I would like you to do, completely optional, right? Totally optional. What I would like you to do um, is just in the Zoom chat, just briefly, just briefly say, who you are, like, you know, just completely optional. Um, you could say who you are, maybe, you know, if you're at a university, which university are, you, you, you're at, um, what your status is, um, uh, what interests you about classics, autism, both, neither, um, just, just anything briefly you wanna, um, you, wanna, you wanna share, or just your name if you want, or nothing at all, if you, if you, um, if you prefer. So it's like answer the question why I'm here. Um, so I'm just going to try to get. Oops, oh, I'm just going to get the Zoom chat back because I. How do I get the? I get the chat back. So this is the chat. Sorry. Chat should be here, I think. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, there we go. Yeah. And how do I get it? Because I had it before where I had the full screen. I'm not 100 percent sure I can do that. Oh, okay. Oh, that's fine. Okay. Oh, that's fine. Oh, if you can't, don't worry. 
I'm just here to present your Yeah, of course. Yeah, 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 sure. Would you like to see the chat? Um, yeah, that would be that would be wonderful. And then how do I go back to sharing again? That's great. Yeah, we can just we can just do it like that. We don't have to do the whole thing. That'd be all right. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's great. Sorry, thank you for all the things people are people are writing. It's just, oh, good. I'd lost a sorry, I'd lost where the Zoom chat was. Sorry, this is a computer I've never used. Oh, this is amazing. Okay, no, thank you know, everything people are sharing, this is wonderful. And we can keep this, keep this going um, while I'm while I'm talking. Just gonna... And so um, you know, I'll keep this just like this, maybe I'll just make it a little bit bigger. And uh, so right now, can people see the um, the current slide, which is choice of Hercules Chin from this panel? Yes, but they think it should go on the way. You think? Okay. Go on, then let's make it bigger then. Okay, ah, and this, uh, this is perfect. Yeah, no, we did it. Yeah, we did it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good. Sorry, 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 everyone. I'm, I'm, this is now the, the dream. This is the dream. Um, uh, I now I can now see the, the slide and the and the chat, which is which is absolutely amazing. And then if we maybe like share the um, not share um, save the chat at the end, I can like you know respond to people afterwards because um, this is this is all like what's coming up is is really really um, is really really special. Um, and so, um, so you know, do do keep typing stuff in. And if you have any, you know, if you have any, you know, I think there'll be like formal time for questions at the end. But you know, we can do it in a more integrated way as well. So if anything occurs to you at any point, stick it in the stick it in the chat. I think it's a really really good way to try. You know, not it's not the same as being in a room together. It's different from that, but it's good in a different way. Maybe it's even better than all being in a being in a room together. Um, because it connects us on a, a really, really interesting level. Okay, so um, so the um, the slide now is showing um, an object that oh gosh, it's dominated my life for, for years. It was a strange one for me. Um, so I went, so I started working at Roehampton University in two thousand and four, and at that time I was actually writing um, an article on uh, Athena, right, a key figure I'd been. Uh, researching and Heracles and then it was a very strange experience for me being in a staff training session on health and safety not that you needed that but anyway, there we go and I realized that behind me in a showpiece 18th century room that was used for things like meetings more than teaching um, uh, there was a depiction of Hercules and uh, and it's something that increasingly over the years I used in teaching and then research, and now then this exp experiential application that I'm now I'm now talking about. So, um, so Roehampton uh, is a very new place in many ways, um, but uh, the university inhabits a number of 18th century villas from a time when this part of London, southwest London, or Surrey as it then was, um, in the 18th century, uh, became very fashionable at a time when villas when Georgian neoclassical villas were all the rage. Um, and during the 18th century, uh, one episode from classical mythology that, so, that resonated so strongly with British people, not just British people, but British people, that it became almost British, maybe more, maybe more specifically English, maybe, I don't know, but maybe anyway, British, let's say that. Um, it became it became something that was was through the prism of classical myth, through the prism, prism of Hercules, was speaking to various 18th century concerns. Now, it's not a myth that's very well known today, right? But it did resonate, including with um, uh, concerns about childhood and how children turn into adults um, back in the 18th century. Um, and uh, but it's not very well known today, uh, and this is. One of the many reasons why I picked it 
um, as a focus for the activities. Uh, because if people have heard of any mythological figure, Hercules, not least thanks to Disney, right? Key landmark moments in the reception of classical myth and classics there, um, was the Disney um, Hercules from the 1990s. Marx a really sort of um, contributed to and also marked a turning point um, uh, and set a turning point, I suppose, um, in uh, receptions of classics, not least um, in children's in children's culture. Um, and so, whereas people have generally heard of Hercules, even if they don't know much about Hercules, this particular story. Right, is going to be pretty well, is likely to be new to most people, which means that everyone can be on the same page, autistic and non-autistic. And when you're autistic, you often feel on the edge of things, like you've got you've got different access to knowledge from um, neurotypical people, but here everyone can be pretty well on the same page. So that's another reason for picking this particular, particular scene. Um, over the years, when I would look at this um, chimney piece panel, I would be struck by different things would strike me right every time I looked at it. Um, and then um, for the Our Mythical Childhood project, um, so that I could use the uh, use it in activities for autistic children, I was able to get some funding so that um, an artist, uh, Steve Simons, uh, some of you here might know his, his work, he's from the Panoply Project, where he and um, the ancient historian Sonia Nevin uh, animate ancient Greek vases. Um, Steve has also done an animation, right? Right, very soon we'll be able to go, go live with it, right? He's done an, a coloured animation of this, of this scene, and we've arranged uh, music for it, especially composed music for it as well, right? So, so, um, so some point soon, I'll be able to share that, share that with you. We're, we're, we're very close to now to go to go um, live with that. Um, so, uh, so here we have Hercules. All right, I said like I'm deliberately now saying it's Hercules. Okay. Um, one thing I will say is that I've been in the room, right, in the room where this that's chimney piece panel is, um, talking with people who don't know much or anything about classics, right? And if they've heard of Hercules, they wouldn't necessarily associate this, the, 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 this figure here, the man in the middle with Hercules. And it's been very, very interesting um, hearing, how, hearing about how they're, listening to how they're responding to the scene, because as a classicist, my eye is drawn to the man in the middle, right? To, 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 to Hercules. Um, but I had a very eye-opening moment back in um, 2014 or 2015, when I was in the room in question, um, running some uh, sessions for a group of young women from the London area um, who were being sponsored to do various activities across the different departments at Roehampton University. Um, they were uh, doing their GCSEs at the time, so yeah, they would have been aged 14 or, or 15. Um, and uh, they, uh, none of them, well, some of them, it turned out, you know, had seen the Disney Hercules, so they did have a, they did have a route in, um, but they didn't know what classics was, et cetera, et cetera, right, and so, unlike, say, me, all right, when I'll see, and I'll see, you know, this is Hercules, and that might be true of other people here as well in this session, um, it was very interesting how their eye was drawn not to the man in the middle, but to the two women. Okay, I thought that was absolutely fascinating. What they saw was not a man in the middle. What they saw was two women, right? Two women whose gestures, well, if any, well, okay, may, maybe the, the man matters, but, 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 it, but it's very much because the, the women, as they saw it, are trying to make a play for the man. Right. So it's all about the, the women and they could they could see they could see themselves in the women rather than the man in the, the man in the middle. Um, so one thing I would just say here is that uh, the lessons, amongst other things, do deal with things like changing of perspectives. Um, so there are lessons that focus on Hercules. There are lessons that focus on the two women here as well. So it's a very detail rich scene. Um, and like I said, every time I'd look at it, I'd see different things. And then when I and I and it was very interesting experience, um, always hearing how um, how people I shared this image with uh, were responding to the scene. 
Um, it was very interesting when I talked about it with a group of theologians at Roehampton, for example, because they were seeing um, this figure here um, as a very Marian, right? And Roehampton also has a centre for Marian studies, right? It's a Mary type figure. And indeed it is, because as well as as well as receiving aspects of the classical world, um, Christian, Christianized concepts, the classics slotted so beautifully into, or was made to slot so beautifully into, um, are very much coming into play here as well. So um, so it's a it's a scene that uh can well canon seems seems very much to mean different things to to different people right and so I'm never telling people how to think right it's all about it's all about use do, doing what it was intended to do in the 18th century I guess which was to encourage people to think about how they positioned themselves as 18th century people um, in relation to very contemporary concerns, not least how to strike a balance between, right, the two women are often conceptualized as virtue and vice or virtue and pleasure. In the 18th century is often pleasure, right? Virtue and, ple and pleasure in ancient Greek, arete and kakia, right? So virtue and vice in Latin, I mean, translation of the Latin, um, but very often virtue and um and pleasure and in the in the the book of lessons um it's pleasure and hard work right it's called a hard work um and so it's all about you know very much about how to strike a balance between um these competing concerns of such key concern to an increasingly industrialized 18th century about what the what the right balance should be between the pleasures in life that the 18th century people loved and hercules loved and um hard work right the 18th century people thought was very important and hercules is very good at um so um so it's so it's something that uh could be very much a talking point um in uh in uh, the 18th century and very much can still be today whether or not you know much or anything about classical mythology hercules etc cetera, etc cetera. um now when i've asked classicists um what way did Hercules choose, right? The way of hard work, okay, this way, or the way of pleasure, right? Hard, the way of hard work, something that will lead to ultimate rewards once he gets to the top of the mountain, okay? Um, or the way of pleasure, that's everything where everything is so immediate, okay? Everything is just so immediate, including the figure of pleasure herself. So what will he choose? And classicists tend to say, right, I'm creating a binary here, but classicists tend to say, well, obviously hard work because he's known for his labors that's the point of hercules now ancient but right ancient versions are more ambiguous here um and 18th century representations tend to like be beautifully ambiguous he's in the process of choosing and you could make an argument you know when you're autistic you're often told you get things wrong or you you internalize like, you feel like you're getting things wrong the whole time there's no right or wrong answer Right. If you say he chose the way of hard work, that's correct, because Hercules is a figure who's always doing labours. Right. He never stops. He never stops having to do hard work. Also, um, in a way that has very much resonated with um, autistic people, um, in a way that led one very eminent autistic scholar to say that sounds like being autistic. It was when I made the point in a session actually in the room where the um, where this chimney piece panel is of um, experts in various aspects of autism research and practice. Um, uh, they were very eager to know like why classical myth, why Hercules? So I gave my take on why Hercules. And it was particularly when I said that Hercules is someone who, who's very good at learning very quickly, right? Because he has to, right? He has to learn very quickly how to sort out particular issues, how to deal with particular issues. Right. He has to think on his feet, um, how to defeat the Hydra, how to defeat the Nemean lion, how to bring back Cerberus. Right. OK, so it's like this one long set of like learning the rules very, very quickly through this amazing blend he has of strength and cunning. But no sooner has he learned the rules, right, that he has to move through a completely different challenge in life and has to learn a completely different set of rules. So it never stops for him. Um, he does well in the wilds where he can um, uh, carry out his uh, impressive labors but it's when he gets to civilization that things often go go wrong and I just want to share like one thing with you um, I like to think of the mountain behind him uh, as um, an image of just autistic overload right the volcano effect where um, when you're autistic you're you're it's like it's like a I don't know an ongoing panic attack right where you're dialed up to 11 right the whole the whole time 
um, and uh, always trying to climb the mountain, right? Um, uh, but everything's very intense, and right, and, and, and experience of pleasures can be intense as well. So everything's dialed up, um, and it can just all get too much, right? Because you're always, um, you're everything is always very intense, right? Okay. Um, so um, I like to see the the uh, oh, and I like to see this sort of what pathway going up or down the mountain um, as Lars. All right. Okay. Anyway, there we are. Um, and so now I mentioned that um, the artist Steve Simons has done an animation and also um, a set of drawings of the scene. Hopefully, I'm going to move right to that. Hope you've done it. Right. So here's one of the the drawings um, that. Uh, that Steve has done. It's got a bit fuzzy and it might be shown as a little bit fuzzy, but the, the, uh, the, the drawing is, is, um, is uh, amazing. He's done, he, as well as doing drawings of the whole scene, he's also done drawings of um, every specific aspect of it. Okay. Um, because the activities, the lessons include um, thinking about big pictures, but also very much about zooming in on particular details. Um, and it was when Steve did the drawing and, and that I was able then to see things in a, in a whole other way because um, I'd never focused on, for example, the basket here and what work it might be doing <clears throat> in the overall scene. Um, when I was talking about the activities and this representation um, with uh, some scholars in medical humanities right at a conference at King's College London in September one of the um, medical experts there this it really and this had never struck me before his take on um what I'd always seen you know very much as a a, a covering right something that's gonna gonna provide shade right a covering over over a tree to provide shade so here you've got everything everything's much more open um, and sparse, rocky, et cetera, craggy, that kind of thing. This side, everything's just so much more comfortable, pleasurable, including the shade. Um, he saw this as the severed neck as a hydra. Okay, that, that's exciting. Um, so I just wanted to share that with you, but just as another illustration of, illustration of how um, I keep being like blown away by what, by what people see. So, um, so uh, what I'd, like you to do um, now just for a just for a minute or two is just look at look at this scene and maybe just put down in the in the chat what particularly strikes you about it um, I should say as well that when I do um, uh, when I do when I've gone into classrooms or done things on on zoom during during lockdown um, one of the things I've uh, got people doing is working sometimes with tablets sometimes but more often um with actual hard copy photocopies of this of this scene um got people to color in right not for all sorts of reasons in, including that when i've done some um uh piloting activities uh in a in a london schools london primary schools autism base it was when the young people were colouring in right, as part of the um, hands-on activities that they started looking in different ways and they started sharing um, various things about how they were responding to the scene. So you could maybe think about, you know, if you were to colour this in, what colours you would use? You know, would you use bright colours for some of the scene or muted colours for other parts of the scene? Would you see it as a scene of two halves? Would you see it very much as a connected scene? seen connected by the figure of Hercules or connected by the mountain perhaps. Oh sorry, didn't mean to do that. Uh, I'm gonna sorry. I'm doing that again going back in the wrong way again. Oh I've done it again. Sorry. Um yeah it's uh Sorry about that. It's the, it's the, something funny. It's like uh, the the mouse on the mouse I'm using here uh, puts things in a different direction from the usual mouse I use. So this is sorry that that, that sorry about that. Um, so yeah. So just um, if you if you want to just put in the chat like what are the key 
things that strike you about this about this scene? They're not all, yeah, and Hercules isn't even wearing sandals. <laughs> just, I've not been ranting here, just responding to something in the chat from Suzanne. Yeah, that's wonderful. Oh my God, the tree looks like an extra person. Yeah. Yeah, so I've been really, I've, I've been very much reflecting on, there, there, is so, there is so much there in relation to nature, for example. And, and nature is personified. Oh, yeah, okay. Oh, I want to do like thank you, thank you, Roger, for commenting on steak as as uh, as, as dinosaur. Yeah, um, I I'm re I just also think because autistic children often love dinosaurs. I've been thinking of doing something with dinosaurs, like maybe maybe right. So I, so I said I said how this um this this book of lessons does mark the end of something, but but maybe I'm not gonna. But it's also the start of something, and maybe I'm not going to leave the scene behind, and I'm going to move to other things. But also, of course, um, in moving to Medusa, who is amongst other things a very serpentine figure, and as someone who's recently written a paper on the Hydra and 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 discovered that it, yeah, one way of seeing um, the top of the covering here is as the, the severed neck of the of the Hydra, and thinking about the the head of Medusa that I want to start talking about and how ser serpentine it is, right? So maybe I'm just never going to leave this, never going to leave this um, behind. Um, uh, I do have uh, in, I mean, it's in the book, for example, there's various things on my, on the blog I've been doing for quite a few years now, since 2009, on autism and myth. There's various examples of colouring in people have done. I deliberately, I deliberately didn't Put any on these slides I and I deliberately didn't bring anyone with me any sorry any of them with me because I wanted you to look for yourselves right okay and, and think what your own connections might be but I think you might be um you know, really really interested in in uh, the range of um responses people have made to the to the scene um you know some people will just put it crudely focus on um on uh, the, 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 the human-like figures um Others will focus on specific and, and the colouring people use, like some, you know, the way some people will use, say, you know, the same colour for. Uh, oh, sorry, I don't know, I'm now managing to move this one. I don't mean to. Um, uh, yeah, they will. They will use, say, you know, the, the same colour for the for the for the serpent as the um, as the uh, the sword, for instance, right? So, uh, so the way in which people are thinking about um, how how colour is, and and, and and often people colouring the fruit as, as a way not least to reflect about what is going on here. You know, everything is so pleasurable, so plentiful that one of the baskets is overflowing. So, what's that saying? Too much pleasure is that what it's saying? Oh, and just um, just um, while you're all looking, I just make one point. You might have noticed that there are actually two versions of this of this drawing. Um, uh, one of which is uh include well uh one of well this this one this one has the figure of um hercules a bit more clothed right um than in the uh than in the actual chimney piece panel um and also the exposed breast of the figure of pleasure has been covered up and i think steve's done a very amazing job of having looked so closely at and, and studied so many um examples of ancient greek dress and and male and female i think he's done it he's done it absolutely beautiful uh, various reasons for, for this so both both drawings are both are very much available but as these well, on the one hand this is something we're doing with children and oh and i have i have now um 
some autistic people just find nudity very comforting. Um, others, well, no, um, or or have a very sort of complex relationship with it. So um, I, I was running a, a, a session for some um, uh, autistic um, uh, young men from a pupil referral unit in London at an amazing place that's Keats House in Hampstead a few months ago. Um, and uh, some of the uh, other representations of Hercules that we were, we were looking at for a sort of compare and contrast thing um, did include um, some nudity. And one of the students was, he got, he got, actually got very, very excited about it. Um, but anyway, so 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 it's um, so it's not the new yeah. So, so anyway, <laughs> for, for, for various reasons and including some of the ones I've I've, I've shared, there are two versions, right? Including this um, clothed clothed one. Um, so uh, what I'll do what I'll do now um, is move through the slides. I mean, I, I'm, I am I just looked at the clock and realised that uh, because I've been I've, like I've, I didn't I say I get carried away, so I, I can stop any. Hi, I can work. Uh, yeah, okay. Just so I can. Sorry, just looking at Ben, who's sort of managing the and coming to help me every time I mess up with the slide sharing. Right. So what I'll do, okay, um, with with Her Hercules still still appearing, or um, or you know, re envisaged version of it, and with the chat still open, if you want to share anything at, at any time, and like I said, I would be very very happy to share the slides with you when the books when the book comes out. This is like an amazing bit. It will exist in hard copy form, um, colourful hard copy form, um, and um, uh, and it will be available uh, as open access as well. Right, so you can buy it. But you don't have to buy it. Absolutely, you don't have to buy it. So it's so you know it's it's going to be available to anybody who wants to who wants to use part or you know, all of it. Um, so what I've just done now. I mean, I I won't go through all of this in um in a lot of detail um but i just want to share with you a few perspectives around um autism that i also um quote in the in the book um in ways that i hoped would very much um follow on from what people shared about um their their experiences you know their, their feelings their responses to the choice of hercules panel um and here's one that um maybe resonates with what people are people have been have been saying um this is a a, a year nine students so a year nine in um the um uk system as so age 13 to 14 puts it um all of your senses are heightened you can hear the quietest sound you can spot the smallest details and some subtle tastes are really strong um, and uh, this was one of the girls at a school who, together with an author, um, wrote, a, wrote a novel about what it is to be autistic um, called M is for Autism. OK. Oh, well, I see. I see the whole references. For, some of the references fallen off here. But if you want the full, this is a reference to something else they'd, um, they, they've um, um, uh, collaborated on. Um, but I realise the whole reference here. Something went a bit wrong there. But anyway, I can share that with you if you want it. Um, now, um, uh, by an amazing, be a beautiful coincidence, I suppose, just as, as I said, um, the uh, very established autistic academic I mentioned earlier um, made the comment that based on what I was saying, that's about Hercules. That sounds like being autistic. I've quoted from him in the book. He's Damien Milton. I'm, he, he's given me his permission to say who he is. He's Damien Milton, who's um, been absolutely instrumental in developing something that's known as um, double empathy theory. Um, and he pioneered. He's he's very much involved in um, a um, a network of people who uh, no brainer, but yet seems so so. So sadly, radical as well. Um, that that very much um, promotes autistic people's participation in research into autism. Um, so double empathy theory is that uh, you've got these two worlds. Um, uh, neurotypical people often find autistic people hard to understand. 
okay because I just way of connecting with the world is so different but the reverse is true as well okay um and being autistic is often about like being just completely bewildered the whole time by this other world this but it's other world that you are inhabiting and sometimes you know doing such a good job at, at inhabiting um but I mean, your masking is so good that you don't seem autistic one reason why for example so many um autistic women autistic women um are diagnosed as adults right it's changing there's so many more opportunities now for girls to be to be diagnosed but um you know because autistic girls tend to tend obviously generalizing tend to be just so much better at masking things and appearing normal putting on the normal mask masks medusa okay watch his face um it's uh uh yeah often their autism is something that they are either masking or just aren't able to acknowledge them themselves until something happens often it's they, they see they see something in their children that resonates up with their children get a diagnosis and they sort of think hang on that's me as well so um but um so as well as damien milton um uh totally seeing that hercules can resonate with being autistic um a, a student of mine at, at Roehampton University, Harry Rao, um, he's um, an autistic um, young man who, um, on hearing about the work I was doing on autism and classical myth, um, asked if he could share with me something he'd written on Hercules. A, a key moment for him as a child was discovering um, Disney's Hercules. It very much spoke to him, right? And it, it was his it was his pathway to doing a classics degree, which he's now, which he's now doing. He's now in his third year of his BA and planning to do a master's and then a PhD. Um, so he's very steeped in it. Um, and it, myth is very much his thing. The piece he wrote um, was just so wonderful. I asked if I could publish it on the um, Acclaim network that um, Esther kindly mentioned at the beginning. Um, acclaim is, oh good, I put the, I thought it sounds like it, autism connecting with classically inspired mythology. Um, I, um, I, I launched it together with Lisa Morris of Barilan University, another member of the Our Mythical Childhood community a few years ago. If you're interested in finding out more about Acclaim, just let me know if you want to join. All right, if you're interested in any, any aspect of autism or mythology or how the two might connect, just yeah, let me know, okay, because we're very much, very much sort of building it up at the at the moment. Um, so, so Harry wrote um, wrote a piece that um, obviously, like with his with his permission, um, uh, I edited and we put it up on the put it up on the on the site. Um, and this is this is you know Harry very much responding to um, how her, the figure of Hercules has always resonated well has resonated with him as an autistic young person um since his own uh since his own childhood so i know as as we're yeah running out of time i'll i will i will read his words now but here they are um and um you can have the slides you can i can send you the link um so you can read his i think uh, lovely perspectives um in detail um Okay, so I can I can pass all over all this now because this is just me showing um, you know where I'm coming from um, and how the stuff I've been doing for this book is growing out of other things I've other things I've 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 done. Um, oh, and here and the bottom one here is the piece on the the Hydra that I that I mentioned um, that I've been working on um, working on recently. So I'll leave that for now. And also, it's um, you know, here's here's some, an example of work by. Amy Milton, right, on the double empathy theory. Um, the work by Nick Walker, I think, is absolutely is absolutely wonderful. Um, so, uh, so you know, so the, the book is very much building from my own experiences and um, research, um, and it's grounded in current thinking. So, here's just a few examples for you of that. Um, it was a, a key turning point for me was when I heard the words of. Jim Sinclair, Jim, Jim Sinclair um, seems very, very recent, but as long ago as the 90s. Um, this was Jim Sinclair, um, autistic, academic, advocate, um, pioneer, um, activist, 
many things. Um, talking about talking very much for an audience of assumed non-autistic people about what it's like to be autistic. Um, was, this was a speech delivered for parents of autistic children, basically saying that you know if you try to if you try to remove the autism from your child, what you'd be left with is a different child, right? Autism is a way of being. It's pervasive. It colours every experience, every sensation, every perception, right? This is why I very much embrace not just autism as consolation, but also autism as um, um, first, <laughs> right? To, um, talk about autistic children, autistic students, autistic people, autistic women, whatever, um, autistic heroes, I don't know, as against people with autism, etc. Right. I understand why people want to put the person first, the child first, etc. But it does help foster a sense that autism is somehow separate from the person um, and therefore can be what treated, cured, very problematic and awful. Um, so um, so a key a key moment away from autism as something pathologized was um, was hearing about Jim Sinclair's words, so I wanted to share those words um, with you. Um, and here's um, more, more recently, sort of just nice compliments to, from Jim to, to Jamie, um, a young autistic student um, on autism is like a stone, right? On one side, it's very warm, like people, what is a stone, right? doesn't seem to be anything there. Everyone just sees that side, but underneath, very few people bother to look under the stone. Uh, under the stone, there is so much, there is so much. Um, and this, amongst other things for me, resonates with the figure of Hercules. You know, I, one thing I ask people, if we'd had more time, I'd have said, you know, what, what do you think what Hercules is feeling here, right, in this, in this strange place where he's found himself? Um, because the range of emotions, right, people have, like, um, thought about in relation to to Hercules here is he excited is he scared right he looks blank people have said so is it that he's 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 gone into such overload right that he's looking that he's looking blank so there's there's just there was so much there so an autistic person might look blank might look like they're frozen right might look might look like they're emotionless underneath they're bubbling with he never stops, right? Just like dialed up to eleven the whole the whole time. Um, um, and just just very very briefly about um, how uh, this is this is autism as 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 constellation, right? Um, it doesn't right. So it, this on the logic that you know, if you think of autism as a spectrum, it's like the the logical extension there is that you could line up every autistic person ever. And they'd all you'd, you'd be able to put them somewhere <laughs> in this line. Um, it doesn't work like that. So the constellation image is is a current one that um, resonates. Maybe we'll move to to other images. But right now, I think it's it conveys just how um, multidimensional um, being autistic is in a way that just so cuts across the labels of people as high functioning, low functioning, etc. Um, so language, yeah, language matters. Um, and um, I mentioned earlier that I find the work of uh, Nick Walker absolutely amazing. Nick Walker talks about how it can be possible to move, I'll quote Nick here, toward a future in which we engage with neurodivergence in ways that unleash previously untapped creative potentials of individuals, community, and humanity as a whole, right? So this isn't just about, this isn't just about, you know, making the world a better place for autistic people. It's about making the world a better place um, for everybody, um, for both, you know, whatever your particular way of being. And I'm gonna, and I'm gonna end, yes, I'm gonna end by explaining the quotation. Well. So earlier this year, um, in April, I took part, um, although remotely, well, and remotely, um, in the, at the um, Classical Association Conference. I uh, wasn't able to get to it in person, which is particularly sad in that it was in God's country. It was in, 
it was in Wales, it was in Swansea. Um, but one of the things I was able to do was to coordinate um, some um, students. Um, again, they were Roehampton students, Poppy and Lucy, Poppy Robbins and Lucy Head. Um, talk, they, they, they created um, videos where they um, talked about um, their experiences being classicists, being um, neurodivergent people. And this was part of a panel that was celebrating neurodiversity and classics for the Classical Association and conference. Um, the videos are all up on the Asterian network site, Asterian Celebrating Neurodiversity in Classics. The link is here. Right, I'm not going to click it now because I'll be able to see it, but um, but you won't be able to because the way the screen sharing is is working. But if you want the link, um, I can share that with you. Just just email me. Um, but the range of things they said were um, were were wonderful. Um, Lucy, for example, talks about um, uh, her, her experiences being diagnosed and the whole world suddenly making sense when she was diagnosed as autistic as an adult. Um, Lucy's now in her in her third year studying classics. Poppy has finished her degree now and is doing a um, master's degree. Um, but, uh, well, not but and, um, some of the things Poppy said, for example, how um, one of the things that neurodivergent people are doing are forging new connections for mythology, um, was I thought beautiful and the connect image um, linking with the title of the acclaim network, autism connecting was I thought just wonderful. All right. and, the and the constellation image of how everything is connecting with, with, with other things was I just thought um, just wonderful. Um, um, and then the final quotation, Lucy saying, utilize it, right? use um, neurodiversity. You can find something you love and really focus on it. But then uh, and in the middle, <laughs> just as we've got the man in the middle end with, with Poppy's quotation in the quotation from Poppy in the middle. Um, if you know that your students are not neurotypical and you learn how to work with them, then it could open up a world of opportunities, right? world of opportunities. OK, so that right. Autism as world consolation, but also world is something that um, I find very exciting. So I started with that quotation from Poppy and I'll I'll end with it. I think it just seems appropriate to end with a with a with a student voice. Um, so yeah, so I've I, I've talked for an hour. I'm sorry, but we did some interactive things. So that's that's um, that's really good. So thank you, um, thank you everybody. And I'm like, can we make sure that the, the chat is saved because I want to read it. You know, at, at leisure. I've been like glancing at it, but um, multitasking can be <laughs> um, yeah hard. Um, so uh, I don't know. Have we got. Time for yes, yes, we have got time for some questions. But first of all, let us thank you hugely for such an interesting talk. So I don't know if everybody's got their little yellow hands that they clap or um, if they just want to physically clap. Um, <laughs>